Today, I'm going to speak about the echocardiography differences in RV dysfunction between acute and chronic lung failure. We will, I have no disclosures at all. Um, and basically, we will start speaking about the evaluation of the RV's function, what are the anatomic and physiologic features of the RV anatomy, and how we can assess the RV function. I won't cover uh, a lot about this because Dr. Rosco already spoke a lot of this, and later on, I will follow about the echocardiographic differences and the etiology of the um, acute and chronic RV dysfunction. Especially, I will mention in pulmonary hypertension and later on how we can differentiate it. At the end, I will discuss a case study. So first, we have to remember that the anatomy of the RV has um, three anatomic units. It will be formed by the inlet, apex, and they follow away by the outflow tract. Uh, we have to keep um, in mind that the RV has a free wall that is thin in comparison with the LV. And it's, um, it's very important to keep in mind that interventricular septum plays an uh, important function in the RV um, anatomy. The RCA is the mostly of the important flow for the RV. And we have more than two papillaries muscles here. Especially we have to keep in mind the RV anatomy is designed to tolerate volume overload, but no pressure overload. In terms of ejection fraction of the RV, it's important that the RV has a complex contraction and when we differentiate it with the LV, involve a sequential movement from the inlet to the apex and then moving forward to the infundibule. Unlikely to the LV, there is less twisting and rotational movement that contribute for the RV pressure and the ejection fraction. The RV basically is larger than the LV in volume, but his mass is less than the LV with an ejection fraction that is lower than the L LV function. So the LV and the RV are connected in series. The output of the right ventricle will be the input of the left ventricle. As I mentioned before, the RV is designed as a volume pump, while LLV is a pressure pump. The RV ejection fraction is associated with a high compliant PVR. So this means that there is an inverse relationship when the function of the RV decreases is because there is an increase on the afterload. This means pulmonary vascular resistance. And as I mentioned before, the interventricular septum plays an important part of the function of the RV and his connection with the LV. This is named ventricular interdependence. This means the position of the interventricular septum will alter the shape of the LV and the RV and in the interdependence is basically mediated in systole, while the diastole interdependence is basically relies on the pericardium. With the measure of the eccentricity index, we can see how these changes can be altered. Basically, we have to remind that the D shape of the LB is one of the signs that we can see in the echocardiogram when there is an increase in size of the RV. In order to assess the RV anatomy of, um, with the echocardiogram, we have three basic views that we will name this. For chamber view at zero degrees, RV uh, inflow outflow, and the mid short axis transgastric. Complementary view, we will have the long axis view, and the three transgastric view that we can assess for RV basal, RV inflow, and RV inflow outflow. Starting from the um, four chamber view is one of the most important views because we can have a lot of information just in one view. Using the four chamber view, we can assess how is the shape and the form of the RV. A normal form will be a triangular shape, but if we start seeing there is an apex format of the RV, 
we can say that there is at least moderate dilatation of the RV. Measuring the end diastolic area of the RV and comparing with the end diastolic area of the LV, we can see uh, if there is dilatation or no. The normal relation is less than 0.6, but when it's higher than one, there is at least severe dilatation. Remember that the RV end diastolic area more than 18 is a sign of moderate enlargement of the RV. Also, as Dr. Rusko mentioned before, we can assess the fractional area change, the ejection fraction, the anatomic MO TAPSI, and also tissue Doppler um, assessment of the function with myocardial performance index. Remember that the fractional area change less than 35% is at least RV dysfunction, but less than 25 will be moderate dysfunction. As he mentioned, we can also measure the tissue annular uh, systolic uh, velocity of the S prime, DPDT uh, measurement when it's present uh, TR and S strain. Moving forward to the inflow outflow view, we, we also can here measure uh, the size of the RV, but basically in the outflow track, the infundibulum and the uh, pulmonary vein annulus. Also, this view will be important to assess with color the presence or not of tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary regurgitation. In the inferior wall, we can measure here the thickness of the ventricle. When the RV free wall is less than five millimeters, this means it's normal, but when it's higher than five, there is presence of RV hypertrophy. Keep in mind that we should avoid the anterior free wall because there is more presence of epicardial fat. In the chair axis transgastric view, we can assess the, again, the shape and his relation with the LV, and also measure the eccentricity index. The complementary view, like transgastric RV basal inflow outflow, will help us to have good alignment with the pulmonary valve and the RVOT. In order to do a spectral Doppler assessment of the pulmonary valve, we will cover this later in pulmonary hypertension topic. Also, uh, trans um, transgastric RV inflow has better alignment for TAPSI, tissue Doppler of S prime, and tricuspid valve assessment. Moving forward, we have to keep in mind that the general etiology of the dysfunction of the RV will be basically related to pressure overload, volume overload, or RV ischemia that will develop RV dysfunction followed by RV dilatation that later on in time will create tricuspid valve, annular dilatation, and tricuspid regurgitation. Remember that the severity of the TR is not directly related to the RV dysfunction. Other signs of RV dysfunction, dysfunction in echocardiography will be increase of the right atrium pressure, decrease of the LV preload, and signs of venous estasis. Moving forward for type of uh, causes of pressure overload, the most frequent will be left heart failure, followed by pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary embolus. Volume overload will be mostly for tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary regurgitation, or ASD. The pathophysiology after we have an increase on the RV after load will be um, RV dilatation followed with an RV wall tension increase that will increase later the oxygen demand of the RV developing a RV ischemia. When this RV ischemia happens, there is decrease on the LV preload with decrease on the systemic blood pressure that also will contribute with more RV ischemia due to decrease in the coronary perfusion to the RV. As Dr. Roscoe mentioned very well, we see in thoracic surgery, we have a lot of new uh, circumstances that will 
increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. So maybe we have a patient that has COPD, emphysema, or any respiratory disease that has mild or moderate pulmonary hypertension. But just the fact of having hypoxemia, hypercarnia, one lung ventilation, increase of PEEP, or reperfusion syndrome will increase the risk of worsening this pulmonary hypertension. A special situations will be protamine reaction, pulmonary embolism, or extensive low lung resection, for example, a pneumonectomy or velovectomy. So why is so important the pulmonary hypertension? Pulmonary hypertension is the most common cause of chronic pressure overload of the RV. And the RV will adapt with increase of the afterload through multiple compensatory mechanisms. Those are RV um, hypertrophy and increase of the venous pressure, specifically with increase on the right atrium size. Regarding the 2018 um, World Symposium of Pulmonary Hypertension, the definition is a mean pressure higher than 20 millimeters of mercurium. And we can differentiate using wedge pressure and pulmonary vascular resistance if this is related to isolated precapillary, isolated postcapillary, or mix. Also, we can have diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension where when our systolic pulmonary pressure is higher than 30 or the transpulmonary gradient is higher than 15. The ratio between mean, mean arterial pressure and mean pulmonary arterial um, mean, mean pulmonary uh, pressure less than four is a robust estimator of significance on pulmonary hypertension and predicts also hemodynamic complications specifically under general anesthesia. So regarding the profiles, um, sorry, I have to move back. Um, in 2022, the new European guidelines uh, by the e Society of Cardi uh, European Society of Cardiology, they cut off the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, decreasing the pulmonary vascular resistance to higher than two wood units. This means 160 dynes in order to uh, do an early diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension and prevent later diagnosis and progression of the disease. There are five profiles of pulmonary uh, hypertension regarding the WHO. Those will be group one with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Group two is basically related to left heart disease. And in pulmonary part, we will have group three secondary to lung disease or hypoxia, and group four is secondary to chronic pulmonary em embolism. So what are the recommendations for assessing pulmonary hypertension with echocardiogram? First, we have to assess if there is any presence of tricuspid regurgitation and the velocity of this jet. When it's less than 2.8, there is low probability of having pulmonary uh, hypertension. But when it's higher than 3.4, there is a high probability. Using the Bernoulli equation, we can assess the RVSP. But also, we have to complement with two more echo signs of pulmonary hypertension. First, we have to take a look on the ventricles and see how is the ratio between the RV and the LV basal diameter. When this is higher than one, there is signs of pulmonary hypertension, the eccentricity index, and the new one could be TAPSI versus the systolic pulmonary arterial pressure ratio less than 0.55. Pulmonary artery, when we assess, we have to assess for pulmonary acceleration time. When this is less than 105, there is high signs of pulmonary hypertension, as Dr. Roscoe mentioned, the presence of mid-systolic nosing and early diastolic pulmonary regurgitation velocity more than 2.2. When the diameter of the pulmonary artery is more than 25 millimeters, it's also a sign of pulmonary hypertension. And later on, 
when we take a look in the venous system, we can see when the IVC diameter is more than 21 and there is an increase in the collapse during the expiration. Right atrium area at end systole more than 18 as well. In order to have better alignment with the pulmonary artery, we will have different views. First, we have to start with the upper esophageal aortic arch, arch at between 60 and 90 degrees, where we can measure the acceleration time. If there is no presence of pulmonary regurgitation using this equation, we can have the numbers for mean pulmonary pressure. But if there is presence of pulmonary regurgitation, we can use the early peak in order to estimate the mean pulmonary arterial pressure using the Bernoulli equation. Other views will be the transgastic RV modificated view and the mid ascending aortic arch short axis. I want to mention especially the presence of acute pulmonary embolism because there is two signs that are specific and especially pressure in this situation. One is going to be the McConnell sign that is specifically related to a dyskinetic mid RV free wall with apical sparring of the RV and the 6060 sign. The 6060 means there is RV um, systolic uh, pressures less than 60 and an acceleration time less than 60 milliseconds. Why is those RV speeds going to be low? Because there is no time for the right ventricle to compensate the increase of the pulmonary of the um, of the pulmonary pressure. So he, he cannot generate higher RVSP. In summary, we will have two causes that will increase the RV pressure overload. Rather left causes of pulmonary hypertension or chronic causes of pulmonary hypertension or chronic respiratory disease. Those patients that are undergoing rather respiratory failure, thoracic surgery, or develop a PE will be increase the RV pressure overload and in then a diastolic dysfunction and systolic dysfunction with RV dilatation. Later on, we should have to get the diagnosis between chronic and acute. Basically, we have to remind that in chronic, we will see signs of pulmonary hypertension we will see a specifically adaptation like RV hypertrophy and increase the right atrium size, but maybe those are not present when there is, when there is um, also, sorry, oh, sorry. When there is a uh, right ventricle dilatation. So finally, what is the importance and the impact of the um, RV dysfunction? Because it's direct associated with an increase of mortality, a low ejection fracture and alert change is associated with post-operative morbidity and mortality, and acute failure has mortality rate from 44 to 86%. Okay, later on, I would like to follow with the study case. So this is a patient of 49 years old that has been basically presenting uh, between six and 12 months of um, decrease of tolerance to exercise that's undergoing to surgery. I won't tell the surgery because here I would like you guys to um, interactively um, help me to do the diagnosis, but here definitely we can see there is an increase on the size of the RV with an increase on the size of the right atrium. We can see how the interventricular uh, septum is flattening towards the left side and the same with the interatrial septum. And there is presence of apex forming of the RV with pericardial effusion. So we start doing the measurements. We can see here our RV is dilated. There is also increase on the thickness. Our tapse is decreased with um, an anatomic MO to 1.5. Later on, we put color, but 
basically I cannot see anything. I cannot say anything about this um, view because it's not adequate. So we move forward to inflow outflow view. We still been having supporting elements of RV dilatation and our annulus of the RVOT is going to be almost 29 millimeters. So my first question is, um, how long is this situation have been happening? Acute, chronic, I need more information. I will okay, wait. Celine, I'm, I'm just waiting for the poll, so I'll share the results with you in a, in a second here. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to end it. Share the results. Okay. 63% said chronic. Okay, ready? We have very smart people here, or we need more information. Okay. So we need more information. We have to see if this patient has pulmonary hypertension or no, right? So we put color here. We have to assess our, um, if there is presence of TR or not. I can see two jets here. So we have to take a decision. Later on, we follow to another view. We measure these um, two jets. Both looks like moderate, between moderate and severe. We are not convinced, so we go to modificated by cable view and we see a complete jet of severe tricuspid regurgitation. And we assess there is a vena contractor of 0.7. Um, we measure our RVSP is 59, and there is an incomplete spectrum, of course. This patient. Um, in preoperative, he has a mean pulmonary arterial pressure of 46. And maybe this is really incomplete. But we have to rule out left, left side causes, right? So here we can see our LV is affected definitely with a D shape. Our coronary sign is dilated as well. But this is a sign of increase on the venous system with an interventricular septum really really moving towards the left side and the same with the interatrial septum. You have to rule out um, how is the inferior vena cava. We can see it's a huge vena cava with a reversal flow that complements the diagnosis of uh, tricuspid regurgitation is severe with inverse uh, systolic flow here. So the third question is, which one of these options will be that cover signs of volume overload in this patient? Okay, everyone's just voting and I'll just give them about 10 seconds, Celine. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to close the polls. Thanks for everyone. Okay, perfect. So we have option one, of course, everything is dilated. The interventricular septum is in diastole. Basically, we can see there is a signs of volume overload, predomination. Um, Okay, so we assess the left side of the heart. There is mitral regurgitation looks like mild with a MR fraction of 29% with diastole, dysfunction of the left ventricle uh, type one. The function is 48%, so maybe our LV is still working well. We move forward to transgastric view. Here we can see is this huge RV. There is signs of ascites here as well. We found right lung with a lot of fluid here. And the left lung is also collapsed with a lot of pleural effusion. So later on, we follow to the assess the pulmonary valve. There is a huge um, mean uh, pul pulmonary artery. 
of pulmonary uh, regurgitation. So we can see here there is a mid-systolic notching, presence of PR. We measure the um, acceleration time that is 99 milliseconds. So there is consistency for signs of pulmonary hypertension. So which one of these two options will have signs of pressure overload? Okay, voting's open. We'll give people about 10 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll in about five seconds. Thank you, everyone. Okay, great. Perfect. So we have signs of pulmonary hypertension with chronic compensation um, mechanisms like RV hypertrophy. So what is the diagnosis of this patient? Okay, polls open. We'll give everyone about 10, 15 seconds. Thank you, everyone. I'll close the poll in about five seconds. Okay. Looks at these people is very well trained. Yes, this patient has chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and he's undergoing to a pulmonary and arthrectomy. So following, I'm going to show you the pictures after the surgery was performed coming off pump. We can see here the interatrial septum is a little bit towards the left, but it's more released on the pressure on the right atrium. The same with the RV. We have persistent of of course, uh, tricuspid regurgitation. That tricuspid regurgitation is still there. We measure the RBSP with an incomplete Doppler uh, around 20, 35, but even though the right atrium pressure right now is a 15 and we started with um, 25 almost, LB is still working properly. The IVC is smaller, pulmonary artery, it's a little bit decreased, the main PA. Even though we still have in pulmonary regurgitation. In the transgastric view, we can see how is a release in the um, interventricular septum with decreasing the size of the RB, but of course, we're still having chronic signs. And the patient is doing really well right now. The RVSP are 33. Um, no other complications. So thank you so much for coming and listen to me. If you have any questions, sorry about the if you didn't understand nothing because <laughs> my language is not perfect English. So uh, should I stop sharing? That would be great, Celine. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celine, for that. That was great. Great case. Thank you for that. So we have actually finished uh, the, the, the session with the three presenters. Uh, we are now open to a Q&A uh, from the audience. Several questions were actually trying to be answered to the, to the team. Um, I have um, one question actually that has been placed in the panel for um, Alex uh, Cavallas. So um, they are asking how reliable uh, is the formula for estimating the fusion volume uh, in patients with uh, prior thoracic surgery uh, or for loculated or complex fusions uh, when we use uh, TE for, for long ultrasound? Hi, thanks for the question. Um, 
basically uh the the two references i've put um have not directly answered uh, the, the the that question in one of the references uh, the method used to validate the formula where we were using just the the surface area alone uh, was in uh, chronic effusions of cardiac surgical patients. They didn't mention if these were um, loculated effusions or complex effusions. Um, however, um, I think that uh, if uh, the locules formed after the effusion formed, most likely it will remain distributed in the same way uh, it, it, it would have. Uh, so most likely it's going to be um, accurate. If, um, if the locules are caused by adherences from past surgeries or past pleural disease, then I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the, the fluid will distribute the same way. So I don't think you could use the, the formula. Um, the, the, second, uh, the second method uh, that, would that was described with the, the depth, uh, the distance of the proximal depth and the distal depth of the probe times the maximal surface area. This was validated by actually instilling um, uh, normal saline in the pleura of patients undergoing surgery. Um, so, uh, so of course, this is a very, it's, it's likely that it's uh, gonna perfectly distribute um, because, of, uh, uh, because of the way it was uh, validated. So, so I'm, not sure, um, I'm not sure you can use these formulas in, in complex, uh, very loculated effusions. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, Alex. Um, for uh, Dr. Roscoe, actually, like um, one of the questions from Stefan Bouchev uh, was asking, um, what's your first choice for inotropic drug support if there, there is uh, RV dysfunction? And he was actually mentioned that his first choice is epinephrine, but they say that it's one of the most toxic uh, inotropic that you could use. So you did uh, actually answer him, but uh, I would like to ask you because again, like uh, for me, and then we have been at uh, Toronto General, we know what it is. I think epinephrine is most of the times like our first choice. So what, what do you have to comment on um, options as uh, milrinone or um, Wdamine? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, having worked in quite a few different centers, each center has their own choice and there doesn't seem to be any difference in patient outcome with whatever you choose. Um, I think the important thing is to choose what you're most familiar with titrating in a patient. So if you've never used milrinone, it's probably not the time to first start using milrinone. Um, and also, who's going to be taking care of this patient post-op? It's probably the ICU, and it's probably the nurses on ICU. And if they've never seen a syringe of dobutamine before, then don't be using dobutamine for the first time. Because it's not just your intraoperative management of the patient, it's who's going to be looking after them for the next few days on ICU. And they've got to be familiar with titrating those drugs as well. So it generally comes down to an institutional preference. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. So for, uh, for Dr. Martinez, like uh, regarding your presentation, it's this actually question is not posted on the, on the audience, but um, in your experience, um, Celine, um, what do you think, like under general anesthetic, which, which will be the, the best uh, way to estimate pulmonary hypertension? Because we are talking about cutoff values, but when those patients are under general anesthetic, uh, those uh, mean PA pressures can be actually lower than expected. Yeah, well, basically you have to assess the, what is the relation between the mean uh, uh, pulmonary artery and the mean uh, pulmonary uh, Systemic pressure. So when there is a relation less than 25% is a high um, estimator for pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so you normally when, when you are in the OR and you're looking at this, um, you most, most, mostly you are looking at your difference between your main yes. PA and your um, mean, mean arterial pressure. And if it's uh, like one fourth, then is when you start to get boring, no? Yeah, all okay. right. There is, there is another question on the pool for um, Dr. Cavallas um, um, from Stefan Langevin. Uh, do you use color Doppler to differentiate atelectasis from pneumonia on long uh, uh, TE? Um, 
So um, there was uh, one of my colleagues from Université de Montréal uh, has done some research on, on this. Um, it's, it might be tricky to differentiate uh, really atelectasis from, uh, from pneumonia based on color Doppler because um, the way, it, uh, so, so even, even with pulse Doppler, you could perhaps emit the, the, uh, the hypothesis that you would have more vasodilation um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in some instances than others. Um, however, uh, I don't. I don't think that he was able to validate this uh, this method. W the way we could use uh, color Doppler is more to differentiate some kind of an organized clot that may look solid um, from uh, from hepatized lung. So if you see color Doppler uh, inside this uh, solid structure that you're not sure is uh, is like clot uh, or or uh, or dense lung, uh, then color Doppler could be useful. Thank you very much. I have uh, another uh, question for uh, Dr. Roscoe. So, and in, in your experience, um, which will be like the single measurement that you will use to quantify uh, RV function with P? My own preference is fractional area change. Um, once you've done it hundreds of hundreds of times, you actually get quite slick at it. But when you start doing it, there's a bit of a learning curve to avoid the trabeculations in the right ventricle. Um, the problem with that is if I do it myself throughout the case, I can follow the trend. Um, if someone else does it post up on ICU, gets a different number, who knows whether that means the RV is different or whether it's the intra-observer variability. But for my own intra-op use, I prefer fractional area change. Yeah, I agree too. There is uh, one more question for Dr. Martinez, uh, Arnaud uh, Badillo, which is one of our uh, previous fellows and uh, really like at the journal. So he's asking, can you comment on the role of inhaled milrinone in the context of uh, RV dysfunction? Um, I never used it before. I heard there is people that use it or even though they put bolus of milrinone. The problem if, with milrinone is you can have severe um, effect when you go systemically, basically vasodilatation in the systemic pressures as well. And basically in this situation, you would like to keep the systolic pressure high in order to keep that RV perfused. Otherwise uh, you will lose also that relationship between the RV, the um, RBSP and your systolic blood pressure. So in my experience, we try to avoid it uh, and I never use it in hail. I don't know if the rest of have more experience. So I, uh, I'm going to do a comment on that. I, maybe, maybe Alex, you can help uh, us here, but I'm, um, I, I read like an article that you guys published uh, from the Montreal Heart Institute with a more than 10 years experience in JCBA uh, about using inhale mill renown for RV dysfunction. Um, one of the things that was commenting on the on the article, if I don't recall badly, is basically like 66% um, of the patients do well with it, but there are a couple of um, situations where like inhale milrinone is not so helpful when you have a prolonged cardiopulmonary bypass time, more than 100 minutes, and um, when you have concomitant LV failure. Um, I mean, giving it inhaled, um, it prevents uh, uh, the, the systemic vasodilatation uh, at a certain degree, but you will have some. So I don't know if you want to, to comment on that. Uh, you have any other experiences? So the so since my experience is most is mostly in the ICU, we uh, we sometimes use it in the ICU, but mostly it's given uh, in the context you just described. So so patients that uh, have. Uh, um, uh, temporary um, uh, right ventricular failure when they come off bypass. So it's used very often in that context. Uh, when we get them in the ICU uh, and it's, it was just a, a transient thing, they usually get much better after. I think they would, in, in many circumstances, just get better by themselves. But, uh, but when we receive them, they've, they've stabilized with the inhaled milrinone. Um, and and sometimes we use it uh, as a, as a repeated uh, nebulized uh, inhaled milrinone in patients uh, that have isolated right ventricular failure with uh, signs of uh, increased right um, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. 
um, we see a lot of patients uh, responding to that therapy. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. And I think another another thing that we we normally don't talk about it's um, is the use of prostaglandins, like in an inhaled version, uh, proposterenol, for example, like uh, short acting. Um, one of the benefits uh, compared to, uh, for example, uh, NO is like uh, on uh, chronic hypertrophic right ventricles, it will actually increase the work of the the work index of the right ventricle, and it will reduce the PVRs too, which is another consideration. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I think Asad uh, Masari now is going to actually give us the results for the poll. Uh, go ahead, Asad, please. Um, we're just going to put up another poll. I'm just curious to see how many people in the audience have access to onboard 3D software, especially 3D RVEF. So if you don't mind just answering that question, we can get a sense of how many of us can actually translate these into clinical practice. Yeah, as the polls open, I'll just give it another 10 seconds, okay? And thank you for all the references that people are posting as well. I will try to keep track of those and add them to the list as well. Okay, so about 21%. How many responders were there, Mark? Can you tell from? Yeah. Yeah, 52. Oh, it's a pretty good number of people responding. So many people have some 3D reprocessing, but uh, not the RV, but 21% have access to 3D RV processing. So thank you.